PFT Live continues on this Thursday morning as we try to understand how the current unrest in sports will or won't affect the National Football League. The Lions, the first team in the NFL to shut down a practice over the shooting of Jacob Blake that happened on Sunday. Joining us now, Mike Tirico, the host of NBC's Football Night in America. And Mike, you live in the Detroit area. I, I, when I heard the Lions had canceled practice on Tuesday, I just assumed there was a COVID-19 outbreak. I, I was both stunned and and awed by the decision of a football team with limited practices anyway and limited time to get ready for the start of the season shut it down for a full day because of what happened so they could let the world know that this is not acceptable yeah mike i'm with you great to see you guys uh, miss all being together and i think the being together part of that uh shouldn't be run over uh matthew stafford if you listen closely to his comments talked about that was the first time they've had that conversation all together, all in the same room, because some of these conversations happened during the Zoom calls, uh, during COVID-19 and all of that. So the power of it had to be really impactful in the room. And full credit here to Bob Quinn, the GM of the Lions, and Matt Patricia, their head coach. Those are two guys who, you know, we know the pressure that's on the franchise, the organization to perform. But... But, you know, the, they're really good and decent people, and they are trying to find a way to lead in this uh, uncharted time. And I give them full credit for taking this step, because like you said, Mike, I thought it was COVID-19. And then I was thinking, wow, to give up a day of practice when every rep matters right now uh, is pretty significant. But this is a significant topic, and it's one that if you uh, turn the other way, you're going to get hit on the other side of the road by it. You have to face this head on for these teams and these organizations and listen to your players. And in the long run, this may have been the best thing that they did. Mike, you're one of the most well thought out, caring people I've ever been around. And if I ever had to make a big decision in my life, I truly mean this. You'd be one of the five people I would call to ask for advice for. So I ask you this just to go like, where do we go from here? I just want to hear like, you know, Mike Tirico's take on this and where sports go with all the social injustice matters going on and kind of your thought on all of it. I appreciate you saying that, Chris. Um, I don't know because I, I'm not in the shoes of those athletes. A lot of those guys are speaking from the heart and from personal experience. A lot of those players are speaking in fear of what's going to happen with their kids. I haven't been in that situation, so I can't give proper perspective to their voice. I do think as I watch the NBA guys, um, in general, okay, just in general, by playing, they keep the message front and center. Uh, and that's not me saying I want to see the NBA playoffs finish. I, I, that's not going to change my life or any of your lives. I just think that if they go back to their communities, we may not be paying as much attention to what they are saying as we will if it's after uh, a game-winning shot or a great NBA playoff game. Most of the players have been very good about using that platform continually in the bubble. After a game, answer about the game, and then tag the answer with, we're not losing sight of the main reason that we are all doing this. It's to continue to bring attention to the racial divide, the social injustice, those other issues. So my gut I'll let you go, Chris. My gut would be if they don't play, they may lose the power of the platform that they are using right now. Yeah, that that's interesting. And I'm I'm happy to hear you say that because it's something Mike and I talked about on the in the first segment, you know, and, and and Mike argued too, and I understand his side of this, that you know, the players have been doing this and here we're still in the same situation. But right. Maybe there, maybe there needs to be a more aggressive approach every time. Like every time a mic's in front of you, whatever that is. Yeah, when LeBron James is holding up the championship trophy, you're right. So, okay, so you think that's still the best voice basically going forward is to be there, be on TV, performing, having people watching, and that's the best way to get the message as is compared to just boycotting and saying, you know, we're not going to play and, and, and do that. Yeah, Chris, I, I think so just in general, but I'm removed again. I don't feel the pain. We saw the Mets player at the podium in tears last night. Uh, we saw players who have shared their story of being in these situations. It's a personal, painful story to tell. So for everyone out there, it's not the same feeling as we have removed from the situation. So I, I always want to make sure that I, I say that. Just my opinion in general, we're going to hear football players when this becomes part of their conversation when the NFL season starts in a couple of weeks. And we're going to hear 
basketball players in the playoffs, et cetera, et cetera. And Mike, my point was basically there's only so much talking that can be done before the Mm -hmm. players conclude that the ears are deaf. How much do we have to do? How much do we have to say? How much do our coaches have to give heartfelt sound bites at press conferences instead of talking about basketball issues before change happens? And I guess that's where I'm at a loss. How do we even get to the point where we can measure the changes happen? There's no finish line here. The finish right. line is stop it. And there's never a point where we're going to be able to declare victory because we're always one news cycle away from the next video of an unarmed black man being shot by police. You're right, Mike. But how can you make that uh, happen less often, to be very candid? How does that happen? It happens with legislation. It happens with education. It happens first with listening. And I think if we go back to the George Floyd protest, what's one of the big things that we all learned? We need to listen. We've been given two ears and one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we talk. I've done more listening than I have about this issue in the past by a wide margin. I think most of the people watching this show have. I think that's a big part of the change that's happening right now. Now, here's the next portion to me. Uh, LeBron James has 70 million followers on Instagram, 40 million on Twitter. I'm sure there's some commingling of those numbers, right? But those 80 or 90 people who follow LeBron James on social media... Can they be activated as true followers? What do I mean? Voting, how they vote, actions that are taken, demands for legislation. Look, once a politician gets elected, what do they want to do? They want to get elected again. So how do you do that? You win constituents support. How do you do that? By supporting causes when people pick up the phone and they say, hey, support this bill about body cams, support this bill about proper police techniques, changes in techniques. So when that happens at the grassroots level, Then there is that change you're talking about, Mike, that's not happening right now. So can these players use the platform in the cities where, by the way, most of them have never been until they got signed or drafted by those teams. Can they do that to leave a legacy of change in those cities? That's where the players can really use their platform to make a bit of a difference. Do you have a a sense or a feel of what you think the NFL should do here to back players? I mean... Or do you have do, do you think NFL players will threaten to skip games? I mean, I know that you don't know the answers to these things, but sure. you know, again, just would like to hear your take on on that. Yeah. Well, the, the template's out there now, right? It, yeah. It's happened. It's happened in a variety of places, bubble or not, COVID or not. Uh, so they've certainly opened a door. You know, players players didn't used to uh, celebrate in a certain way until they saw other players do it, right? People didn't tweet their feelings at post game until they saw other people do it. Now everybody does it. So once the door is open, it gives everybody the opportunity to follow. So that is certainly out there. I think uh, if if I'm NFL management this morning, if I'm leadership in the league, I'm making sure that I'm having real conversations with the leadership of our players and finding out what's the temperature, what's the conversation like, how do we make a difference as your partner? I, I think we'll see the league making very significant moves to be true partners with the players here in trying to support their cause and use this platform that more people watch than any other entertainment vehicle in the country, the National Football League games. I think we're going to see that happen as this season goes on. The question will become, when we have a bridge like this to cross, how do we go about it and how does it get done? One thing that wasn't impacted yesterday, there were no fans in the stands because of the bubble, right? So what happens if fans are let back into stadiums and something like this happens? Then you do run a larger risk of disappointing your customers. And at the end of the day, for all of us, we may do this because we're journalists or we may do this because we're analysts or for business reasons. We are consumers and customers. We are the people who have to deliver product to the customers as broadcasters, as players, as a league. So if you start to lose your customers, you have to be concerned about that. And, Mike, it was just yesterday morning that Chris and I spent an extended amount of time trying to reconcile Roger Goodell's recent comments to Emmanuel Acho in the Mm -hmm. Uncomfortable Conversations with the Black Man series about supporting players unconditionally, unequivocally, if they choose to kneel during the national anthem, with this effort by Jerry Jones to thread a needle that has gotten smaller. The camel is larger, and the needle is smaller over the last 24 hours. How do you think this is going to play out with the Cowboys? Because I personally think the NFL needs to tell Jerry, you have to step back and let your players decide what they want to do without any type of direct or indirect interference. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that, that's going to be a, a one that absolutely bears watching, Mike, and that's going to be one that they're going to have to deal with directly. And I'm sure not just Jerry Jones, but ownership around the National Football League is going to be put into a different light, I, just like NBA ownership is now. The Bucks ownership didn't know, found out, said they supported. Mark Cuban has come out in support of. The N NBA Board of Governors, so their owners, they're meeting this morning at 11 o'clock. The NBA has certainly been a more progressive league than the other leagues, but I think as we see more people following the lead of the NBA, it's going to put pressure on the other leagues in every group, from the players to the league office to the ownership of how they respond to these situations. Times have changed. It is very different now than it was nine months ago or six months ago. And that's not just with COVID-19. That is with the true conversations that are be ha being had about race in America. And NFL owners, if they want to continue to have a game that prosper, they're going to have to deal with this directly within their buildings and with each other. I, I think the league office has pushed there farther than I really imagined they would in such a quick time. And I applaud them for the things I've heard them say and the plans that they are putting in place for this coming season. Now it's going to be up to ownership in these cities to continue to follow up in that path. And, Mike, you mentioned the influence that a LeBron James has over basketball. Mm -hmm. In football, even though he's only been on the field for 31 regular season games, Patrick Mahomes is becoming, yeah. for a variety of reasons, he's got the charisma, right? He can, and he will say what he believes, and it just and it and it comes across well. I, do you see him emerging as we get deeper and deeper into these issues as the NFL's primary voice when it comes to these matters of social justice? He might because of his youth and because of his accomplishment all at the same time, like you said. Now the, N the NFL is a, a league where predominantly the star players have been the white quarterbacks. And now here's Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. Those players have helped change the conversation. You don't really talk, and players before that, obviously, like Donovan McNabb, and before that, Randall Cunningham, we go on and on. But certainly we're seeing more African-American quarterbacks play in the NFL. And doesn't matter what you say, the quarterback's the most popular guy in the room in the National Football League. So because of all of those things, yes, he has been delivered to this point. You don't have to say you have to act like LeBron James to be worthy of being the voice or face of the league. Sometimes that's put on you. And it takes time to mold into that. So he's been thoughtful about everything he's done so far. Uh, I'm sure he'll be thoughtful about this. But there are also veteran voices in the league who've been around. And I think those players together can help the Patrick Mahomes or the new players of this era to be a loud voice. That video that came out during the year, you know, pushed by Malcolm Thomas and the video that went viral and post George Floyd, that was significant. Patrick Mahomes' inclusion in that helped give it a lot of its traction. So those are some of the players, I think, who we're going to be watching as this season starts. How do they lead their teams? And how much is their voice heard publicly in these conversations? Yeah, that's right. It's going to take quarterbacks, guys like Mahomes, to further this conversation and make society wake up a little bit. Um, all right, let's go to another issue, pandemic football. Yeah. All right? I mean, for one, are, are you you know optimistic here as we get closer and closer to the start of the regular season? And two, I'd love to get your you know feel or thoughts on – the competitive conversation right now, the fans in the stadium, the fake crowd noise, where that like, wh how, how do you want to see football played with no fans in the stands or this competitive imbalance? Yeah, we could we could do three hours on this, guys. And there's so many different roads to go down. Let, let's start with what the league has done. I think the league has done everything possible to get to the starting line. And I applaud the players and obviously all the folks, uh, starting with Dr. Alan Sills leading the medical effort for the league and on through all the athletic trainers and the people who are handling this within each building. The effort is massive every day. And we all see it. Any of us who've gone back to work or been in a situation where work is happening, the effort to just make sure it's as safe a workplace as possible is extraordinary. Uh, and the measures that the league is taking and the things that they are thought about about how the competition can take place. I think the league, because of its resources and its organization, and the fact that they had the longest runway of any of the pro sports, they're going to get to the starting line. I candidly would have loved to have seen the players come a Friday uh, after testing was done, have a mini bubble, not asking you to stay away from your families for the whole week, but from Friday through Sunday, even if you're at home, to treat it as such. 
uh, to have some some confidence that everyone who tested negative on Thursday or Friday is competing on Sunday and has been in some sort of a, a bubble. So you don't have to worry about that as much. I, I, I know there are, there are some issues with that. I've raised that to some folks within the league, but that's something I thought may have put the players in more of a comfortable area. In terms of the competition, this is going to be an unfair year. Nobody will be uh, given a lot of uh, pillows to lean on when you say this wasn't fair for me this year. This has been fair for no one. No one's going to care that our jobs are going to be tougher to do football night in America or if Notre Dame plays to call Notre Dame games. Nobody cares. Everybody's life is tougher. You're going to have to deal with it and figure it out. If you have to play a game in front of 10,000 and your state won't have fans for two or four weeks, it stinks. That's a bummer. you got to overcome it. you you got to overcome it. People have won road games in this league on the biggest stages in the most important games so you got to go win a road game with a little bit of crowd noise. But to me, that's not a big deal. As far as the uh, ambient sound being played in the stadium, I'm just going to lean back on what the baseball guys have said. That they, they got used to it. It's odd when you hear noise and you don't see people. But afterwards, it, it's worked out okay. It's been odd doing TV like this. But after a while, we figured it out. And, you know, even with you, Sims, it's somewhat watchable. <laughs> so so we, I, I need to laugh. We've been talking about serious stuff for two hours. So we, we, we need some of this in life. And I think, I think the coaches who tell their guys right away, guys, the whole equity in the National Football League, it's going to be fair, even playing field. That might not be the case. That is not an excuse this year. The team that sets that tone within their locker room is going to have a much better chance of hitting the curveball when it's thrown at them. And, Mike, one thing that fans need to get comfortable with is the possibility that when we conclude the regular season, there won't have been 256 games, and some teams will not have played 16, others will have played 16, and there may be some awkward playoff positioning based on winning percentage, not based on gross wins and gross losses, and that's just going to be one of these additional factors where, yes, it's not fair, but nothing's going to be fair this year. Let me channel my inner Florio, find a conspiracy theory, find the uh, the oddest route out there. Mike, what happens if there's a quarantine in a state and it's a division opponent and there will be no travel waiver? You can't come from a hotspot state X to our state to play a game. And you may have to go to a neutral site to play what would have been your home game. And that's the game that might decide your division. Could happen. Again, You cannot say it's not fair. This isn't the way it happened in 2007 when I came in the league as an assistant coach. Nobody's going to care this year. The league, the league has set up a good committee. They've set up a bunch of folks who know football, who are going to be out there trying to make sure that whenever possible, it's fair and balanced. It probably won't be. And that's going to be something you have to deal with. And look, football, what do we hear? Hey, Chris, you've lived this with a thousand coaches. What do we hear all the time about football? It's the unexpected. It's improvise and adjust. Lee Corso, when I worked with him, would always tell us, guys, you got to improvise and adjust. This is the all-time improvise and adjust season. The team that is ready for that, I think, is going to save a lot of stress and anxiety worrying I, about what was me. I can only worry with what I can only deal with one conspiracy, Mike. All right. So, like, <laughs> chill out. All right. I mean, gosh, I got to deal with this guy every day. Now you. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I was I was with for. you, Mike, until you until you used the word oddest. Then I wasn't quite sure whether or not it was a compliment or not. But, you know, <laughs> to your point. This is not unprecedented. We've had weather issues, right? When Katrina hit New Orleans in 2005 and the Saints were supposed to host the Giants, what happened? The Giants hosted the Saints. And then the Saints played wherever they could find a field the rest of the season. The Vikings had their roof collapse. They played a home game against the Giants in Detroit, right? So Mm -hmm. the NFL has shown that it's willing to be flexible when it has to be. It's just there's going to be a lot of potential flexibility that gets crammed into one football season. And and that's why I think you saw Commissioner Goodell put together that group, that committee of uh, folks who represent different parts of the football world. Uh, for those exact issues and how do we address them going forward and Chris you brought up a point and I was going to get to it and then my answer got off the rails and long-winded but the other part I'm so curious to see is that first game that first game is really the first game you know so we I was talking about week one the second half is usually a wild higher scoring affair because guys haven't played four quarters and in, invariably, if you're in shape and you're in condition or your team has what it takes, you can make a difference in a higher scoring second half. 
guys haven't played a snap. Officials haven't been on the field for a snap. It is going to be a really bizarre start to this season that we don't know if it's going to be all 16 games, if you're going to get all eight home games, all the other stuff you talked about. So we are in, if we ever get to focus on the field, which might not be the most important thing in the world, and maybe this year has made us realize that. But when we do commit to that portion of our lives, it's going to be a season like we haven't seen before. It's going to be really hard to handicap. And I think there are going to be teams that will surprise you out of nowhere because they've built something in their locker room that they can take to the field and togetherness might matter a little bit more than uh, how you run why sticky look and all that stuff. Hey, Mike, before we let you go, our good friend turns 40 in two days. That's Christopher's birthday. Do you have any advice for him for this new chapter in his life that begins in 48 hours? Yeah. Um, you know, you will you'll start to feel it on a regular basis. You complain <laughs> often. You complain often about you know, how you go oh, this and that. But now, now you're really, really, really going to start feeling it. I will tell you, Mike, in all this, everything re-airs uh, during the pandemic. They re-aired a holiday bowl from many, many years ago when young, fresh-faced Chris Sims threw three absolute dimes against Joey Harrington in Oregon at the end of the game. And his receivers didn't come through. I will, I will not mention the receivers' names. They were young. But Chris threw three dimes. And they took off his helmet. He was a little upset. He took off his helmet. And I said, oh, my God, he has aged like one year in 15 years. It's ridiculous. He looks the same in 20 years. He looks exactly the same. So that's going to change, Chris. Yeah. You see, Florio's gray. I've lost my hair. It's going to kind of move across the screen from this end here it's coming your way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Mike gets to hear me complain a lot on, like, Friday mornings when we're in Notre Dame where I'm, oh, my back hurts. Oh, I'm tired. So it's only going to get worse, Mike. Okay. <laughs> and now it's going to be real. Now you're not just going to make it up. Now right. it's going to actually be painful. Well, hey, Mike, thanks as always for some of your time. We know you're busy this morning. It's great insight. And it's great to talk to you. And we we hope to see you in person some way, somehow, before too long. Thanks again. Stay yeah. safe. All the best to your family. And we'll talk soon. See you, Mike. You too. Thanks, Mike. Happy birthday, Sims. Thanks, buddy. Okay. All right. There he is, Mike Tarico. We'll be back to wrap up this Thursday edition of PFT Live right after this. Hi, I'm Mike Tarico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.